I just want to say that I uh, want to thank here uh, not only Professor Harosh for accepting our invitation, but also the Spanish Research Agency and the French Embassy who has supported us in uh, getting him here. So now I pass the word to Luis, who is going to make the introduction of our speaker today. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you to everybody. I have to put my glasses or it was I don't see anything. So it's a real pleasure to welcome here today, Professor Sir Harosh, who together, as you know, with David Wineland was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in the year 2012. And I quote, for groundbreaking experimental methods that enable measuring and manipulation of individual quantum systems. Professor Harosh research has been carried out in the castle Brossel laboratory that you see mentioned there at the Ecole Normale Superior in Paris. His main, main research activities have focused on quantum optics and quantum information science with very important contributions to cavity quantum electrodynamics. He has also worked at the CNRS, the Ecole Polytechnique and the Collège de France where he was the, its president, it's not called president in French, but he was the president up to 2015. And now is uh, their emeritus professor. Uh, the scientific career of Professor Harros is marked by many other Nobel laureates. In, actually, in 1966, when he was a young student, he witnessed the announcement of Kastler Nobel Prize for optical pumping methods. He did his thesis on the dress atom formalism under the direction of Claude, uh, Claude Cohen Tanuji, who also won the Nobel Prize in 1997 for the cooling and trapping of atoms with laser light. Subsequently, his postdoc at Stanford University was in the laboratory of Arthur Shallow, Nobel Prize in Physics in 1981, for the development of laser spectroscopy. Also, when he was there, coincided with Theodor Hens, I guess, uh, who was 2005 Nobel laureate in physics for contributions to the development of laser-based precision spectroscopy, including the optical frequency comb techniques. It was then that he conceived his idea of studying Ritvor uh, states, of which we will hear today. And this proposal earned him a position at the Col Normal Superior in 1973 as a member of the CNRS. Soon he became a full professor at Paris 6 from 1975 to 2001. Since the 1980s, uh, Professor Harosh has designed creative experiments to study quantum phenomena when matter and light interact and to develop the techniques that have allowed to control Rydberg atoms and realize cavity quantum electrodynamics. His ideas on non-destructive photon counting were paramount in generating Schrodinger cut states of light and studying the phenomenon of the coherence, which eventually led to ways to exploit cavity quantum electrodynamics to perform demonstrations of simple quantum information steps. In addition to the Nobel Prize, he's a member of the French Academy of Science, and among many other recognitions, has received the Einstein Prize for Laser Science, the CNRS Gold Medal, the OSA Herbert Walter Award, and Charles Hart Towns Medal. I would like to finish by mentioning that I had the privilege of attending an extraordinary talk that Professor Harosh gave, I still remember it, in Bath in 1999 at an IOP publishing meeting where he was a plenary speaker. On that occasion, I invited him to Madrid, but he really accepted and he imparted one of the seminars of the Nicolás Cabrera Institute on March 2000 here, not in this location, but in this uh, faculty when he talked about experiments with single atoms and photons and exploration at the heart of quantum physics. It is a great honor to have him here again today. Professor Harosh, the floor is yours and we are ready to enjoy your lectures on quantum science with giant reader atoms. Just a final remark, when he finished his talk and after the questioning and so, a group of students are going to interview him that will be recorded and be in the YouTube channel of IFIMAC. I was told by the organizers that if any of you want to remain here for that time, please stay. And the others who want to leave, leave and allow to do this interview that will be recorded. Okay, Professor Harotz, thank you very much. So thank you very much for this. Uh kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be here again after such a long time. 
and uh, to talk to you about the physics of uh, giant Rydberg atoms. In fact, as has been, uh, as, as you said in your introduction, I have been working with these atoms for many, many years. And so they are my favorite atoms and I'm very glad to be able to talk to you about them. In fact, Rydberg atoms have played a very important role in physics since the beginning and since even before the beginning of quantum physics. So for 150 years, they have been very important first to understand uh, the laws of quantum physics and then to do experiment with them. And I will try to recall this history before I come to describing the experiments in which I have been involved myself. So this makes uh, the outline of my talk clear. I will start by talking about Rydberg atoms and the birth of quantum physics. Then I will describe how circular Rydberg atoms in cavities have allowed us to uh, do thought experiments, the experiments, experiments which are the kind that the founding fathers of quantum physics had imagined to illustrate the basic feature of superposition and entanglement. And then in the last part, I will tell you that these atoms are now back at the forefront of physics because they allow us to implement quantum information and to demonstrate that uh, one can do quantum simulation with, with these atoms. So. Uh, these atoms are really very important and they're also very simple. Uh, I think one of the reasons, uh, I think it's a good topic for a general audience, is that you don't need to know a lot of things about quantum physics to understand them. These are the simplest possible atoms, the atoms that Bohr imagined at the beginning of the century. And the only thing you have to know is that the energy levels of these atoms are, are uh, quantized, and that's what Bohr introduced. So you only need to know this quantification law, this quantization law. And from then on, most of the properties of this atom come very simply by just back of the envelope estimate. So you don't have to make very complicated mathematics to understand them. And uh, they look very classical. So it's something that we have uh, that our intuition can comprehend. But in spite of the fact that they look classical, they also exhibit strong quantum effects, which, which would be the topic of this lecture. So this is the first reason. Uh, the, the other reason I think which makes them interesting is that uh, uh, they exhibit atomic physics at an unusual scale. These atoms interact with each other, for example, at distances which are thousand times bigger than the distance uh, which is ordinary encountered for uh, normal matter. So it's a little bit like going in the, in the when you when an atomic physics atomic physicist work with this atom, it's a little bit like going in the in the world of giants of Gulliver and the society. So it's it's very interesting. But of course, the main reason why I'm talking to you about them is because I have been working with them a lot, and I have found it very fascinating and fun to work with these atoms. So I'll try to convey this feeling to you. So let's start with the beginning. In fact, uh, these atoms are named after Rydberg, who was a 19th century uh, physicist, Swedish one, who tried to make sense of the spectrum of the hydrogen atom. It has been known since the beginning of the, the 19th century that atoms emitted discrete line. Uh, it's uh, German Fraunhofer who has discovered that at the beginning of the 19th century. And the simplest of atoms, hydrogen, uh, exhibits a series of spectral lines. You see on this uh, picture a red line, and then you have a blue line and a dark blue line and a violet line. And the discrete spectral lines of hydrogen are in fact associated to couples of integral numbers and which Rydberg discovered, and you see here with uh, Rydberg handwriting that the position of this line is given by uh, the difference one over m1 squared minus one over m2 squared, where m1 and m2 are integrals. And you see, for example, in this series can be interpreted if you choose m1 equal to 2, and then m2 equal to 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. And this is called the Balmer series. If you replace, m, if you take m1 equal to 1, you will get the Lyman series. And if you take m1 equals 3, you will have the Passion uh, series, and so on. So this is a formula which allows you to classify in a regular way by using a simple mathematical trick all these lines. And it's even more than that. If you, instead of hydrogen, you go to alkalis, you have the same expression, but you have to correct M1 and M2 by small corrections. 
which later on would be called quantum de defect. So it was rather simple, but of course the problem is that there was no explanation for that. It was just a mathematical uh, observation, so to speak. And one had to wait a quarter of century between this uh, Rydberg formula and to have a hint, an explanation for that. And uh, between uh, these two, uh, between uh, 1885 uh, and uh, uh, 1913, which would be the year where Bohr would intervene, uh, a lot of discoveries have been made, made, as you know, and one has discovered that the world was not continuous, that classical physics, which assumed that all physical quantities were varying continuously, should be replaced by something else. Uh, you know that Max Planck in uh, 1900, in order to understand the spectrum of heated bodies, the fact that the, uh, the distribution of, of uh, the colors emitted by, uh, by some uh, bodies that you heat uh, is going up, uh, reach a maximum for a given wavelengths and then is going down at very high wavelengths, could not be explained by classical physics. It was called the uh, ultraviolet catastrophe. And to explain it, Planck introduced the fact that light had that had to exchange energy with matter, not continuously, but by chunk, by, by discrete amounts. And it was the introduction of the quantum physics. And you all know this formula. The energy exchanged by a light of frequency F is given by this formula. The amount of energy is H times F, where H is Planck's constant. Uh, you have to remark that this constant has, the, of course, the dimension of an energy multiplied by a time, uh, H is called uh, e over f, so it's an energy multiplied by a time, but it's also a momentum multiplied by length, and a momentum multiplied by length is, in, in classical physics, an angular momentum. So this would be important in the following. Then five years after Planck, Einstein uh, generalized this idea and said it's not only the exchange of energy which are quantized, in fact, light itself is quantized, and this explains the photoelectric effect. And it's for this reason that Einstein got a Nobel Prize in 1921. So uh, this, this is the first introduction of discrete quantities in physics, but this discreteness was also uh, confirmed by uh, the discovery of the constituent of the atom. Uh, uh, Thomson in uh, 1897 discovered the electron and uh, Rutherford in 1909, the positive charge, the nucleus, and for the simplest atom, it was a proton. So it happened at that time that the natural model was that the atom was made of a heavy nucleus around which a light electron was uh, rotating. And Rutherford and the French uh, physicist Jean Perrin uh, imagined the uh, planetary model of the atom. It was quite natural since the Coulomb force has the same uh, structure, the same uh, uh, de dependence on distances at the uh, gravitational loop. So this was a model. And then Bohr came in the game. Niels Bohr was a young uh, postdoc of Rutherford, uh, took back this image of uh, an electron rotating around the nucleus. He imagined the simplest trajectory, which is a circle. And when you consider a motion on a circle, the first uh, concept which comes to mind is the angular momentum. The angular momentum, which is, as you know, the product of the radius of the, of this, uh, the circle on which the rotation takes place by the velocity and by the mass, mvr, it's an angular momentum. And so Bohr assumed that since h has a dimension of an angular momentum, if you want to quantize, it's clear to say that the angular momentum must be n time h. In fact, he did not take h, he take h, the famous reduced Planck constant, h over 2 pi, h bar, and we understand in a moment why. But it, the important point here is that the angular momentum is quantized. So this is one relation between V and R. There is, of course, another relation between V and R, which is Newton's law. M, e, e, uh, the force is equal to M times the acceleration. The force is, of course, uh, E square over R square, and the acceleration is M times V square over R. So you have another relation relating uh, v and R. And if you have two relations, you can extract from them very simply V and R. And what you get is that the radius is proportional to N square. And you have 
the quantity h, h bar square over m e square, which is uh, the Bohr radius. So you see that from very simple high school or even middle school uh, mathematics, you find that if you just if you accept the idea of quantization, uh, the size of the electron orbit should scale as n squared. The velocity in the same uh, way you find that the velocity is one over n. Now, what about the energy? The energy, the uh, potential energy is one over r, so it should be one over n squared. And the kinetic energy is v squared, so it again should be n squared. So if you add the two, you find something which is n, one over n squared, and you find this famous formula. The energies are scaling as one over n squared. And then next board's idea was to say, okay, how does the atom go from one orbit to the other one? It emits or absorbs a quantum of light. So HF has to be given by E1 uh, minus E2. And by doing that, you immediately find this formula, which is nothing than Rydberg formula. So he found the Rydberg formula just by making one hypothesis, which is the angular momentum is quantized. And in order to fit with the experiments, he had to modify H and he said, no, in fact, it's H over two pi. Otherwise, you would find uh, a spectrum which would be two pi time too, too big. So this was what happened in 1913. Uh, Bohr had also introduced the idea of the correspondence principle that you might have heard about, which says that if you go to high quantum numbers, you should retrieve classical physics because if you are high quantum numbers, it means that the fact that the, that the quantities are discrete is no longer important. You, you go continuously uh, from discrete quantities to a continuum. So what does it mean in this case? Uh, giant atoms should behave classically. And of course, how big they, they are. If you take n equal 100, you get 10,000 times the Bohr radius, and this is something which is of the order of a micron. So you have the size of a bacteria or a virus. If you take n equal 1,000, you get something like 100 micrometer, we get something which is of the size of the diameter of a hair. So it's already something microscopic. And if you dream to have an atom with n equal 10,000, you get a, an orbit which is of the size of one centimeter. So really, then you have a microscopic object. And the correspondence principle should apply. What does it mean? Uh, first of all, I have to tell you that, of course, the energy, the binding energy becomes very small. So we are talking about extremely low energy physics uh, in the range of micro to nano electron volts. So it's something which is very, very small, which means that the system are very fragile. For, so for n larger, very large compared to one, the electron frequency is given by one over n squared minus one over n plus one squared. And if you develop this, you find it varies as one over n cube. So it means that the square of the period varies as n six, and this is varies as the cube of the orbital radius. And this ratio, which is n independent, just expresses the third Kepler's law. The square of the uh, period is proportional to the cube of the orbit radius. So, and this is the classical law, of course. So you see really that these atoms are planetary atoms which obey uh, Kepler's law. So it was nice, but still there was something which was not very satisfactory. And for example, Einstein was a little bit skeptical. Einstein uh, wrote in 1920, he wrote to Lawrence, that this idea is quantizing the angular momentum for no other reasons than it fits the data is something puzzling. And he said, he even said that this Bohr quantization rule is the worst of our quantum puzzles. And then some explanation for these quantum puzzles arrived in 1923 with De Broglie's hypothesis. What De Broglie did was to generalize to matter the photon properties. He said, okay, if you start uh, look at the energy of a photon, it's E equal HF. The momentum is just the energy divided by the velocity of light. So a photon has a momentum HF over C, which is just H, H over lambda, where lambda is a wavelength. At this point, he said, okay, let's assume that the same relationship should apply to a massive particle. The photon has zero mass, but let's apply it for the electron. So you take P, for the electron is mv, well, m is the mass of the electron, and you write this as h over lambda, where lambda is a wavelength. 
And this wavelength is just H over MV. So the boy made the hypothesis that uh, an electron and then any other object like an atom or a molecule has also a wave-like character with this formula. And this is rather strange because you see that it not only mixes quantum physics in the game, but it mixes also relativity because the formulas for the, uh, the, the photon are a relativistic formula. So it makes this kind of heuristic mix between quantum physics and relativity come to this idea. And this gives immediately a clear interpretation to the Bohr's quantization rule. The electron which is going around the nucleus on a circle has a wavelength, so it's a kind of wave. And to be stable, this wave must assume an integral number of wavelengths on the circumference. And so you write n lambda equal to 2 pi r, and this is a 2 pi coming in here. And this means that mvr is equal to n h bar. So the explanation was much more satisfactory than just the Bohr's rule. And Shang was very happy and he really thought at this point that a big jump had been made here. In fact, uh, De Bruyne, uh, in fact, uh, presented his thesis exactly 100 years ago. I think it was in November 1923. And uh, Einstein wrote to Langevin, who was the thesis director of De Bruyne, telling him that uh, his student has lifted uh, a part of the Great Bale, which was hiding uh, the quantum world to us. So this was very important. And uh, the Bohr wave mechanics justifies the Bohr angular momentum cotization rule, including the two pi factor. And a few months later, of course, as you know, Schrodinger derives the equation which describes the evolution of this wave and the quantum physics became accepted. So uh, the, the, these Rydberg atoms now uh, will be uh, the subject of this lecture. What are their properties? They are very exaggerated features. Uh, I compare on this table what uh, has the property of low excited atoms with n equal of the order one, two, three, and Rydberg atom, and I just took one uh, uh, value, n equal 100, which is of the order of magnitude of the Rydberg atom we are playing with today. First of all, the orbital size squared scales of n squared. So instead of having one angstrom or two angstrom, you have now one micron, one micrometer. So it's a big atom. The relative lifetime, which is very important, is the time it takes for an excited atom to go back to a lower state. If you take the n equal two state of hydrogen, its lifetime is about one nanosecond. Uh, and, but in fact, if you go to higher and higher end state, the, the lifetime scales as n cube if you have a low angular momentum state, and as n to the fifth power if you have a circular state. Why do circular state why are circular state more stable than low angular momentum state? It's very easy to understand classically. A low angular momentum state is, has an elliptical orbit, which brings the atom very close to the nucleus. When it's close to the nucleus, it has a very big acceleration. And Maxwell law tells that the radiation rate is proportional to the square of the acceleration. So it's a classical law which tells you that low angular momentum state would be short-lived, uh, relatively short-lived, whereas when the uh, electron is going on a circle, it, it has a minimum possible acceleration, and then it varies as uh, one, uh, uh, n to the five. So for low angular momentum states, the lifetime is about 100 microseconds. For high angular momentum states, it's about one second. So you have an atom which survives for about one second on, on a circle if n is equal to 100, and this would be very important. The spacing between levels varies n minus three. So it's in the optical domain for low, low end states. So that's a, explain why hydrogen has a spectrum with visible light. But if you go into Rydberg states, you get now a strong coupling to microwaves. You lose four orders of magnitude. And so these atoms are very sensitive to microwave fields. The last point I want to stress is the Van der Waals coupling. You know, when, the simplest form of interaction between two atoms is the van der Waals force, which is due to the fact that the fluctuation in the dipole of one atom induced correlated fluctuation on the other, and the atom attract or repel each other. I will show you that for Rydberg atom, it increases as n to the 11th power. So it's a huge effect. For ordinary atoms, this effect is observable when the atoms are at nanometer distances from each other. For example, two atoms in a molecule 
interact at a distance of about one or a few uh, nanometer. For Rydberg atom, you get the same kind of interaction at 10 micrometer. So these atoms interact at distances which are 10 to the fourth time bigger than an ordinary matter. So these are very interesting properties. And this explains why when, uh, when uh, you mentioned that I did my postdoc with Art Shallow, at the time the laser were developed, and I had to look for a topic to do after my postdoctoral work. And I was fascinated by these orders of magnitude. I thought it would be very nice if we were able to manipulate and to work with these atoms. But there was a problem. The problem, of course, is that they are very fragile. And before the lasers, observing these atoms in the lab was impossible. There was an exception, though. This atom had been observed in the 1960s in the interstellar space. What happens is that uh, electrons are captured by ions. You have ions in the very low density gas. Uh, the light of the stars is ionizing by photoelectric effect uh, the atoms. So you have ions and you have electrons. And the electrons can be recaptured. And when they are captured, they are captured on circular orbit because uh, there is a very large impact parameter. And then they cascade down. And this light can be observed. And you see here lines corresponding to transition between Rydberg state in hydrogen, helium, carbon, and many other elements. And you distinguish the line between different elements because of the reduced mass effect, because the electron is going around the nucleus, the nucleus recoils, but it recoils less and less the more massive it is. So you have to correct in the Rydberg formula. The, the naked mass, uh, mass of the electron replace it by a reduced mass, which is slightly different and explains why you can distinguish and uh, among these different lines. But in fact, the record from what I read in the, uh, on the internet, in fact, is a transition in carbon between seven, the, uh, circular state 732 and 731 the radius of the orbit is 50 micrometer. So it's a very, very big atom. So this is a point where this physics was until the laser could be developed. And once you have had the laser, it became possible to excite from the ground state efficiently and to bring the electron very, very close to the ionization limit. The principle of the experiment is like this. You have a first laser which excites from the ground state to the first excited state. And then before the uh, atom had the time to decay, a second step of laser excitation brings you very close to the ionization limit in, into Rydberg states, which at that time started with n of the order of 10, 20, 30, and then we could go higher and higher. And of course, when you do that, and these are the lasers, was dye lasers, lasers which could be tuned in frequency. These are the kind of dye lasers which are pioneered by Ted Hange when he was working with Art Shadow in Stanford. So I had, I could put my hand on this first laser. And in Stanford, I just went to a, a low excited state in, in cesium. But then when I came back to Paris, I decided to do this exploration and to go into Rydberg state. When you do that, you excite only low angular momentum Rydberg state because each photon carries one unit of angular momentum. If you start from an S state, which has zero angular momentum, you can go on it up to two. If you go, want to go to circular state, you have to feed a lot of angular momentum into the system. I show you here the spectroscopic notation. S means uh, uh, angular momentum zero, P is angular momentum one, two, three, and so on. And if you want to go into this state, what you have to do is uh, to excite the atom with radio frequencies because the transition are in the low frequency range. And not only radio frequencies, but circularly polarized radio frequency, so that each photon add an, one unit of angular momentum. So you can increase the angular momentum in this way. And I, I will not describe in detail what happens, but you see that the classically the orbit, which is elliptical, becomes more and more circular until you reach the highest possible angular momentum, which is a circular one. The process had been pioneered by Dan Kleppner from MIT. I won't describe the way we, it is done in practice. There are several ways, and we adapted this method uh, very quickly in our lab. So we are able to get into these, these states. Now, another interesting property is that Rydberg states can be detected by applying an electric field. You can ionize them very easily because they are weakly bound. 
So what happens, you see, when you, you just have to put the atoms between two uh, metallic plates and apply an electric field. So what does this electric field do? If the electric, electric field is very small, it will start to pull the nucleus out of the orbit. And this will slightly change the, the period of the electron in the orbit. This is called the Stark effect. You modify uh, the energy, slightly the energy of the atom by an effect proportional to the square of the electric field. This is very useful because it's a way to tune the, the atomic transition between two, two Rydberg states. But what happens if you keep increasing? At some point, the system will break and an electron will be ejected and you can detect this electron with, with a channel electron, for instance. And you see what the, the interesting point is that the field that you need to break the atom becomes smaller and smaller as you get higher because the system is less and less bound. So you see what happens in a ramp of electric field. You start by ionizing the highest n value here, 60. And for higher and higher field, you ionize the 59, 58, and the 50 atoms. So you can selectively ionize the atom, which means that if you make a transition between two circular states, you will see it by a change of the, of the characteristic of this field ionization process. So this is a method that we have been using for many, many years. So let me now go to the second part of the talk in which I will describe very briefly the kind of experiment we did with this atom uh, between the year 1990 and let's say 2010. We, we wanted to take advantage of the fact that these atoms are very sensitive to microwaves. So what should you do? You should uh, just have first to be able to excite these atoms one by one. And we send them across a cavity which can sustain a microwave field. And it has to be very good cavity because we want the photon to stay in the cavity for a time long enough, in particular for a time longer than the time it takes for the atom to cross the cavity. So for that, we had for many years to improve the technology until we were able to do that to excite. And I won't enter into the details, but you have to be able to excite a circular state with a well-defined velocity because we want to know how it, beha it behaves when it crosses the cavity. And we needed to have a cavity which was able to keep one photon for about a tenth of a second, which was a long time at the atomic scale. So what, what is an important parameter in this experiment? First of all, what is the important parameter for uh, the field? We are operating with a transition around 50 gigahertz, which is a resonant transition for Rydberg atoms with Z equal 51. So the excited state, I call it E, and the lower state, the ground state for this problem is G equal N equal 50. The important parameter for the field is the amplitude of the vacuum fluctuation in the cavity. So this is a, the second quantum concept introduced here, even if a field oscillator is at its basic level at the ground, ground state, you cannot avoid fluctuations of the electric and magnetic field due to the Heisenberg uncertainty relations. And in fact, these fluctuations give a field which is basically the energy of one photon divided by the cavity volume. And this is the square of the field. So you take the square root of that and you get, in our case, uh, a vacuum field fluctuation, which is of the order of three millivolt per meter. So you see, again, this is something that you don't need a lot of quantum physics to do. You just the volume of the cavity, you can measure it with a ruler, and uh, all the rest is uh, constants of physics. And now the, the other important parameter is, of course, the size of the dipole of the atom, which is just A naught squared. And this is, again, something that you could measure with the ruler, so to speak, just the size of the Rydberg atom. When you take the product of these quantities, you find 50 kilohertz. So this is the rate at which the atom will couple to the field. It looks very small because if you compare it to the frequency of the photon, it's only one part in a million of the frequency of the photon. So it's a weak coupling. It does not change a lot the energy of the system, but it still will have very important effects on the system. So look, look here at uh, the, the levels which are relevant. What is the ground state of the atom field system? You have to put the atom in the lower state G and zero photon. How can you put one excitation system? You can put it either in, in the field, so you go from G0 to G1, or you put it in the atom and you go from G0 to E0. 
And at resonance, E0 and G1 have the same energy because the energy of the atom is equal to the energy of one photon. So you have two levels which are degenerate, but they are coupled by this interaction. And we know in quantum physics that when two degenerate levels are coupled, the coupling is, is just, uh, the degeneracy is lifted and you get one symmetric superposition of the state E0 and G1 and the anti-symmetric superposition and the separation is precisely h bar omega. So what happens? Suppose that you start with the excited atom with zero photon. It would be a superposition of these two states. And this superposition will evolve with the phase of this state different from the phase of this state by h bar omega t. And if you want to compute the probability to be in G1, you have an interference phenomenon. You have two amplitudes which evolve with different phases. And depending on the phase difference, you will have a maximum or a minimum in the probability to get into G1. So this is a, called the Rabi oscillation, and it's a quantum interference effect. It's like the young double slit experiment, except that you do it in time and not in space. And so this is the kind of oscillation that you see. How do you do that? You just have to let the system evolve. You interrupt the evolution at some point by just uh, uh, getting the atom out of resonance, and you measure the atom by the fidelization method, and you find it either in E or in G with probabilities. And in order to get these probabilities, you have to do the experiment again and again and again. You get the probability, and then you change the time, and in the end, you get this Rabi oscillation. So this is something which is quite simple. It's a quantum interference effect, and it's a quantum effect that you observe with your your Rydberg atoms. So in fact, we did that with two cavity setups. The original one was a setup in which the atoms were crossing the cavity at a few hundred meters per second. And uh, uh, so the interaction time with the cavity field was 100 microseconds. Then uh, much later, we went into to a setup which is more uh, precise. We start by cold atoms in a magnetic optical trap. And then we push the atom up. So we have an atomic fountain. And the atom, when the atom reach, the cavities are slow. They are a few meters per second. And just before they enter in the cavity, we apply the circularization process. So we get circular atoms into the cavity, and we detect them when they leave the cavity. So it's exactly the same setup, but turned by uh, pi over 2. And the advantage that we can get much longer interaction times. And you see the progress. This is what, what we got with the, first cavity, and this is the signal we get when we can have 20 rabi oscillations before the atom leaves the cavity. But what I want to stress is this is a periodic exchange between circular state. And so it means that it's a kind of ping pong game in which the atom emit a photon, reabsorb it, reemit it, and so on in a regular way. And in, at a given time, the wave function, the state of the system is a linear superposition of E0 and G1 with amplitude, which is the cosine, the sine of this phase accumulation. And you see that at some time, when these two quantities are equal, we get a maximally entangled state, a state E0 plus G1, in which you cannot separate uh, the state of the atom from the state of the field. So this is called entanglement, and we did many experiments about that. It means that when the atom leaves the cavity, if you do a measurement on the atom, immediately the field has to be in the mirror superposition of 0 and 1. And you can then send another atom and recopy re this entanglement and have an atom-atom entanglement. Now, you can also uh, uh, take advantage of the fact that as soon as you have been able to entangle two atoms, you can build what is called a quantum gate. So the, so that, that is that you have a system in which uh, one of the two partners can control the evolution of the other. It means that if you make a measurement on one, the other has to fall in the correlated state. This is called the quantum gate. And, and in this case, the atom and the photon play the role of a quantum bit. And you store information so you can demonstrate simple operations with the system. So it was part of our work. But I must say that when we started all this, we had no idea about what quantum information was about. We are just playing with that, and then suddenly we realize that we are doing quantum information. And that's this is something nice. 
So you see here, in fact, after a half year association, you go from E0 to G1. So you can prepare a single photon this way. Here you prepare maximally entangled photon and so on. Next, what we did is to redo the same experiment, but instead of doing it in vacuum, we do it with a small coherent field in the cavity. What is a coherent field? Just a classical field. You have a source of microwave, you attenuate it until you have only a few photons in the cavity, but you have a field which has a well-defined phase. And if the field has a well-defined phase, it cannot have a well-defined photon number because of Heisenberg and that relation. So you must have a dispersion in the photon number. This means that when you do the radiosation, now you have a superposition of sine function. But if you have, if the number of photons increases, the frequency of the oscillation increases because it is proportional to the amplitude of the field, which is the square root of the photon number plus one. So we have to check this formula. And when you do the experiment, you find that the rabi oscillation collapses very quickly, and then nothing seems to happen at a later time. Uh, you recover. And the explanation is uh, quite clear. Uh, you, you, in fact, you superpose rabi oscillation of uncondensed frequency, proportional square root of phase. So after a very short time, they get out of phase with each other and the signal vanishes. But since you have a finite number of such oscillations, after some time, they will recover in phase with different number of terms for each of them. And this is a revival signal. If you take the Fourier transform of the signal, you get peaks corresponding to the different photon numbers, and the position of the peak corresponds to the square root of n loop. So this kind of experiment is a direct evidence of field quantization. You see that the current field does not have its spectrum as a continuous spectrum, but has a spectrum made of well-defined separate peaks. So uh, what I described so far is what happens when uh, the atom and the field interact resonantly, exchange energy. If you detune the atom from the field, the rabi oscillation will not be able to occur anymore because it, it doesn't conserve energy. So the rabi oscillation disappears, but there is still an interesting effect. What happens is that the field in the cavity whether it is even the vacuum, but field of one photon and two photons and so on, shift the energy levels. It is called the light shift. And in fact, the light shift is a fundamental effect which had been uh, discovered by Claude Grantanoji, my thesis advisor, at a time when there were no lasers, but he understood that. So you see what happens, level E is slightly, with a single photon, level E will be shifted up a small quantity, which is the square of omega, divided by the detuning delta. For those of you who know quantum physics, it's just a second order perturbation theory. And the lower state goes a little bit down by the same quantity. And the important point is that because of the exaggerated feature of Friedberg state, this shift can reach three kilohertz, which is something that you can measure. And this non horizon coupling, what does it do? It, it means that if you prepare a superposition of ENG, in the cavity, it will evolve slightly at a slightly higher frequency. And after time t, this superposition will acquire uh, a phase accumulation, which is omega square t over delta, where t is the time during which it happens. And this is a phase shift per photon. Each photon will change the accumulation time of the atomic uh, coherence by this quantity. And this meant, uh, led us to do this experiment in which you can count the number of photons in the cavity in a way which is quite different from the usual way. The usual way to, to detect photons is just to, to destroy them by the photoelectric effect. A uh, photon comes on a cathode and ejects an electron, and the photon is dead. Here, the photons cannot be absorbed by the atom because it's not resonant. But what happens is that the presence of one photon in this cavity changes the frequency at which the atom is evolving. What do you have to do to see that? you have to sandwich your cavity between two classical field zones. In this zone, you apply what is called a pi over two pulse, which prepare a superposition of state ENG. You let it evolve and you catch it up in the second zone here. And you can arrange the system so that the atom will end up in one level if there is zero photon in the cavity and in the other level if there is one. 
This method is called the Ramsey separated field method. It's an interferometer because you have, in fact, an amplitude which depends upon two passes again. And this is, in fact, the interferometer which is used in all atomic clocks, all microwave clocks. The only thing is that the atomic clock is cesium atom in the ground state here. It's the Rydberg atoms. And if you choose omega squared t over delta is equal to pi, you have a perfect correlation between zero or one photon and atom in E or in G. Again, it's a quantum gate. It means that one photon controls the outcome for the other system. And so it's a, but this is a dispersive quantum gate. And you see the kind of signal you get. We, we start with a cavity which is in a ground state at zero degree. In fact, we cannot do zero degree uh, because it will be the absolute zero. So we leave the cavity at 0 0.8 Kelvin at, at the bottom of the cryostat. At 0 0.8 Kelvin, uh, Planck's law tells that there is 95% probability that the cavity is in the ground state, but there is 5% probability that you have a photon. And what happens? You see the cavity is in the ground state, the atoms emerge in the blue state, and then when a photon appears randomly, you have a long time during which there is a photon in the cavity, and then the photon disappears. And we accumulated statistic, and you find indeed that you have these plateaus only 5% of the time. But the most important point is that you see that a lot of atoms agree about the fact that there is a photon in the cavity. So it's not destructive for, for the photon. And you can look at these two levels of uh, forming a qubit. But another important point to notice is that if you have, if you set a system like that, and if you have more photons, you see that zero photons will give the same signal as two photons, four photons, and so on. And the one photon will give the same as three and five. So in fact, what you're measuring here is a parity of the photon number. And this is important for some application in quantum information. So here I have described what happens when uh, one how one photon changes the frequency of the, the atom. But the, 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 opposite, the converse effect is also true. One atom changes the frequency of the cavity Field in, 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 of the field in the cavity. And think about what it means. You send one atom across the cavity and the frequency of the cavity changes. This is a, uh, known in uh, optics as an index effect. The atom, which is non resonant which means the, the atom is transparent. It's a kind of transparent uh, plates that you insert in the cavity and which slightly change the frequency of the field. But you know that it's a very special uh, index, uh, refractive index, because you can put it in a superposition of state. So what we do is that we inject in the cavity a small field. So a small field is a field which has a well-defined phase, uh, which means that uh, it's an arrow which points in one direction, but it has a, some fuzziness uh, due to the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. So you can represent it by an arrow with a fuzzy tip. And this, is a, this phase depends on the source that you are using. And then you send an atom, you prepare the atom in a state superposition. And you see that if the atom is in level E, the frequency of the field in the cavity will increase if the atom in level G to decrease. And you get out of the cavity. And you see at this point, you have an entanglement, but of a different nature as the previous one. You see that it's a correlation between the energy of the atom and the phase of the field. And you can say that the phase of the field is a kind of needle which points in two different directions. So you measure the energy of the atom, in fact, by the phase of the field. If you make the measurement here, it's not very clever because you will collapse the system and you will get a classical field with one phase or the other. The clever thing to do is to use the second Ramsey zone here to mix the two levels. And once you have mixed the two levels and that you detect the atom downstream, you have no longer any information about the state in, in which the atom crosses the cavity. And what quantum physics tell you in this case is that the system will collapse into a superposition of fields having opposite phases, either the plus superposition or the minus superposition. And this is called a schrodinger cat state for reasons which uh, will appear uh, are clear. In fact, what you are doing in this experiment is to uh, correlate a small system, which is two-level system, the atom, with a field which may have many photons. So the field is much bigger in the sense of quantum physics than the atom. 
And so we have started to study this so-called Schrodinger cat, photonic cats. And uh, we have been able to reproduce their, what is called their Wigner function. The Wigner function is a 2D representation of the field in which each point uh, uh, represents, so to speak, the amplitude in the phase space of the field. And you see that what we get this kind of Wigner function after many, many measurements, these two peaks co correspond to the field which have opposite phases. So, so to speak, the, the live and the dead cat. And in the Wigner function, you have a very interesting feature here with fringes, positive and negative fringes, which are a signature of the fact that you have a quantum interference, that these two peaks are not classical. They are connected to each other by a phase relationship. And this is a point, critical point. I hope that the movie will work. What we have done is to study how the quantum interference disappears. That is, we take the Wigner function, which requires a lot of measurements, and then you redo an experiment and you leave for a longer time the system just leave in the cavity before you measure. And then you can superpose or you can add all these features and you see what happens, I hope. Yeah, look at the fringes and the time evolves. And you see that after about 15 or 16 milliseconds, the fringes vanish. So in this experiment, and now we have a system in which you have either one or the other, but not a quantum superposition of the two. And why do still keep two peaks? It's because we are measure, we are averaging over a large number of realization. In each one, uh, you get randomly one or the other. So this is an observation of decoherence. And we found that the decoherence rate is proportional to the photon number. That is, if you have 10 photons, it will decoher 10 times faster than you have only one. It means that you have, like in a classical field, one zillion photon, then it will decoher before you are able to do anything. And it's a kind of illustration of the transition between the quantum and the classical world. At this point, I just want to uh, acknowledge the work of my co-workers, because we have been working for many years together, Jean-Michel Raymond and Michel Boyne, who had been my uh, students and, uh, and have stayed my colleagues during all these years. And these experiments have been done by three uh, graduate students and postdocs uh, who are now uh, having their own experimental work and uh, independent PIs now, but I wanted to mention them. So, and also I want to mention here that all the theory and all the explanation about this can be found in this book that I wrote with Jean-Michel Raymond about uh, almost 20 years ago. And we made in the book a comparison between this experiment and the one which have been done by uh, the group of Dave Wenand in, in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Uh, Dave Wenand is manipulating ions with laser light, and we do the opposite to manipulate light, that is photons with beams of atoms. But the two systems are, so to speak, the, the, the two sides of the same coin, and, and the, the theory are very similar. Now, very briefly, I want to go to the third part of the talk. This happened about 15 years ago. And then new things have happened in the field. It has been understood that Rydberg could be useful not, on, not only because they interact with microwaves, but also because they interact with each other. And for that, new technologies have to be developed, ways to keep the atoms at well-defined distance and look precisely at how these interactions uh, uh, work. The interaction between two Rydberg atoms, and I will be talking mostly with circular Rydberg atoms, is just a, the a spin, kind of spin exchange interaction, a dipole dipole interaction. It's a product of the dipole of the two atoms, which is a scalar, and you have this term, which, is an, which depends upon the angle between the two atoms. You see that if you have two atoms like that, they don't interact in the same way as if they are like that, and this difference is given by this term. And what happens when, what does this interaction do? Suppose that you have one atom in the state, 50, uh, let's say 51 or 52, and the other with n varying by one unit. Then this coupling couples these two states. And again, you have a flip-flop between the two. This is called a spin exchange, a resonant interaction. It's shown here. You have here, for example, the n and minus one 
which is degenerate with n minus one n, and you have a rabiosiation between the two. It's called a foster resonance in this case, but it's something which varies as one over a cube. What, may, what happens if you excite now the two atoms in the same state? Then this state is not degenerate with anything because if it goes up, it will take a little bit less energy than if it goes down. So it means that at, if, if you are in the same state, then it will be a second order. It will be a non-resonant interaction to just push a little bit the energy and this push is proportional to n to the 11 because it will be n, the, the product of two dipoles is n to the four. If you, elevate, if you raise it to the second power, it's n to the eight and the denominator will vary as one over n cubed. So you get a huge van der Waals interaction, which is what I told you before. And you see that you can, do the, all these experiments if you are able to manipulate the energy levels of the atom. So you have to be able to excite the atom to Rydberg state. You have to be able to keep them at a fixed distance from each other. You have to be able to detect them selectively. And you can tune their interaction by applying electric or magnetic field. And in this way, you can perform, and it's a field which is very active in the world now, quantum simulator of a spin system because you can use two Rydberg state or the ground state the Rydberg state as a fixed issue spin and, and simulates what happens in physics. So uh, first, a few words about the, how do you excite them? Again, what you do is excitation with two lasers, but now uh, contrary to what I described before, we don't, the two steps, are, the intermediate step is non-resonant because you don't want to populate this level. You want to make sure that you can go from the ground state directly to a Rydberg state. So you make a two photon excitation, but with no resonance in the intermediate step. And if you do it properly, you will have a rabi oscillation. The atom will go from the ground state to the Rydberg state and back, depending upon the time uh, you leave the system on. And if you stop here, you will prepare with unit probability the atom into Rydberg state. This, is text, this comes from uh, experiments which have been done uh, about 10, 10 or 12 years ago by a group of uh, Antoine Borwais in uh, Institute of Optique in Paris. I use it just to show you that it works well. The Rabi frequency now is a product of two Rabi frequencies divided by the tuning, which is basically what I've already described. And this is one way to prepare a low angular momentum Rydberg state. Now in, in the lab, my lab, which has now been taken over by Michel Boyne, and all what I will be describing now are not experiments that I did myself, but I'm just witnessing what uh, Michel Boyne is doing. The same process occurs. You go into this level. Then with a microwave, you excite to this state, 52F. And then you go with radio frequency, circularly polarized radio frequency photons into a circular state. So this is a circularization process. What is very nice with this experiment is that you can undo the thing. You see here, you, you, you are here, but if you go on with the rabiosiation, you will come back here. So you can go from the one state to the other reversibly. And here the same is true. You go here and then you can apply the circular process in the other way, apply a microwave pulse in the other way and the laser and come back. And if nothing happened in this state, you will retrieve the atom here. If this atom has gone to another state, it will not be back here when you apply the reverse process. What do you detect? What you detect when the atom is in the ground state, you apply a probe laser, which excites resonantly the transition to this state and which will give you fluorescence from the atoms. And so what you see is that this fluorescence will be the detection signal. And you see that we we'll detect the atoms only if they have stayed during the process here and you will lose them otherwise. So this is basically uh, uh, the, what we, is being done. And you see that we have two kinds of Rydberg spin, either the Rydberg spin here with low angular momentum or the Rydberg spin here between two Rydberg atoms like that. And you see that if the atom is going from 52 to 50 by a microwave transition, this state will not be detected and you will not see any light when the system comes back. And these are the experiments which are done in Paris. And I will tell you why. Uh, I think there are more promises in this experiment than in this one. 
And this one is more natural. A lot of interesting results have been obtained. But if you can do this, we have an advantage. So what is the goal? The goal is to trap atoms in a lattice at well-defined distances, a large assembly of Rydberg atoms. And that this will emulate a spin system. Each atom could have a spin up or a spin down that is a Rydberg or a ground state, or two Rydberg. Various kinds of Hamiltonians can be uh, engineered. And uh, for example, in the case of circular atoms, we have a paper in which uh, we describe what can be done. And these Hamiltonians describe magnetism in quantum matter physics under different conditions. And uh, what is interesting is the fact that as soon as you have more than, let's say, 30 or 40 atoms, the Hilbert space has a dimension 2 to the n. And a classical computer would be unable to compute exactly what happens. But you can simulate it with a system. And you have a detection which allows you to tell whether each atom is up or down by the method they have described. So uh, the hope is that this simulation will be useful to search for novel quantum phases of, of, matters, of matter. So let's uh, say a few words about the experiment, which I think is, is a kind of uh, magic thing. You see, how do you, how do you trap atoms? So the way to trap atoms is just to focus light on, on them. If you focus light on a cold atom, uh, the, dipole, the dipole interaction between the light beam, the electric field of the light beam, and the dipole of the atom will push the atom towards light, high light intensity, towards the focal point. So in fact, the focusing is equivalent to building a kind of potential well. It's called a tweezer. And the, tw the tweezer technique has uh, been uh, recognized by the Nobel Prize of Arthur Ashkin uh, a few years ago. So you do, you do that by just focusing light very strongly in this region where you have a cold atom gas. So you need lasers to cool the atom. You have what is called a magnet optical trap. And you focus your laser beam on this trap. And when you trap one atom, you see it by the probing techniques that I described. You have a counter probing beam here, which produce fluorescence. And you just separate the, this probe beam by, by beam splitter here, detect the fluorescence. And you see the, that you have a level of fluorescence corresponding to the scattering of light by the probe. And at some point, the signal disappears because you have a background gas and you have collisions which expel the atom from the trap. But you can can keep them with a good vacuum for seconds. But you have only one atom. And the reason why you have only one atom is a very interesting one. It means that if you have two atoms, you get light assisted collisions. They got a lot of energy and they are much hotter than they were in the in the cold atomic beam and they are expelled. So if you have if you have trapped by chance an even number of atoms, nothing is left in the trap. If you have trapped by chance an odd number of atoms, the last atom remains, but all the others are expelled. So it's a technique to prepare only zero or one atom in the trap. And it's a not the de deterministic single atom source. And then there is a very interesting effect which has been studied uh, by many groups and pioneered in particular by Philippe Granger, who was yesterday in a, the moderator in one of your uh, discussions. You just can trap two atoms. You can make a double tweezer. You just focus light on two separated points. You do it very simply. You have first laser. You just divide the laser in two, and you send another beam at a small angle. And so you get two focal points, which means that you can now control two points at a distance that, that can vary continuously. And you, if you are lucky, one time out of four, you get one atom in each. And then you try to excite. So you have your laser system, which excites from G to a Rydberg state, first atom. But then there is a problem. The second atom cannot be excited because of the van der Waals interaction, which shifts the atom out of resonance. This is called the Rydberg blockade effect. Two atoms cannot be excited in the vicinity of each other. One atom prevents the other one from going up. And this is, again, a uh, quantum gate effect, as I will show you in a moment. Uh, think something which entangle atoms. Why? Uh, because you immediately understand that since the laser is overlapping the two atoms, in fact, you don't know which atom has been excited. What you prepare is a linear superposition of ARG and GR. 
this is an entangled state. And so it's uh, something which is basic to build a quantum gate with simple operations. So you, you, and what you can show also is that the rate at which you go from the ground state to this state is square root of two faster than for one atom. And this is the reason why this system, in fact, the, the paper which describes this effect in the beginning of the year 2000 by Peter Zoller, Ignacio Sirac, and Michel Lukin in, 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 at MIT is a paper which triggers a renewed interest into Rydberg states. There is another point which is also very interesting, which means that you can extend this for n atoms. Suppose that you have a large number of atoms which are all within a Rydberg blockade radius. You can excite only one, but you don't know which one. In fact, you prepare a superposition of this kind. And so you can now store information much faster because this goes at the rate omega square root of n. And you can store information in a collect. You can make qubits with collection of atoms which are coupled much faster. And uh, quote here, all the people who were involved in the theory and in the first experiment. So we have all the ingredients required uh, to understand what I will say now uh, very quickly. First of all, what you need to prepare is not two, but you want to prepare an array, a regular array of atoms. For that, we use a technique which I think uh, is, is really fantastic, which is just to, to send a, a laser beam, which has a very large waist, so it's, it's a kind of plane wave which falls on a score, what is called a spatial light modulator. It's a surface which is made of pixels which can be individually controlled. Each pixel would behave as a kind of, of a small refractive index. It means that you can now control the phase distribution in the plane as you want. And once you have done that, the laser beam is focused tightly. And at the focal point, the property of optics is that you get the Fourier transform of the phase distribution. So if you want to have any intensity distribution here, you have to work back ways and find the phase distribution which will give you that. And this is a technique which is used to build an array of tweezers. So you see, again, the same experiment. You have a special light modulator, and you focus it on, on a mot, and you see that one out of two sides is occupied. And you see it because you shine probe light, and you see each, each point where you have an atom gives you fluorescence. But there are a lot of places where you don't have anything. So what the people do then is to have a movable tweezer and very fast to take atoms on the periphery and bring them in the empty hole, in the empty uh, places. And within a time of the order of milliseconds, using a computer and a good algorithm, you can assemble a regular configuration. So you get all the atoms in the ground state. Then you use your lasers to excite them. And I will just show you here what happens in, in, in one case. You get when you make that make the measurement, you find that one out of two atoms is visible. It does not mean that you don't have atoms here. It means that these atoms are in the excited state. So what you have created here is an antiferromagnetic system in which the atoms try to not to get close to them an atom in the same state. And so you have this antiferromagnetic structure. This is a beautiful experiment performed in the group of Antoine Bourgeois, and I borrowed from him, and he, in fact, uh, he has uh, uh, made a, a startup. He has built a startup company. But I want what I want to say is that there is a problem here: is that you have to go very fast because once the atom is in the upper state, he is not trapped anymore. In fact, it is anti-trapped for reasons which will appear clear. And so, if you do that, you will have to do all the experiment at a very short time, and you will not be able to observe the effects which require adiabatic passage and the, and the many interaction between the atoms. So why, why is it so? If, once the atom is in a circular state or in any Rydberg state, the electron is quasi-free. And what happens to a free electron in a light field? The light field is just uh, bringing the atom very fast from, makes the atom oscillate at its frequency very fast. This is a positive energy. It's just a kinetic energy of vibration. And this positive energy is not a potential well, it's a potential heal. So as soon as the atom is excited, it will, it will have a tendency to fly away. So what do we have to do? 
the, in fact, what we can do is to switch from this kind of trap to a trap which will uh, trap the atom at a minimum of electric field. It's, it's called a bottle beam trap. It's a field configuration which surrounds the atom by walls of light all around. And so the atom wants to stay in the minimum electric field and stays in the middle of the bottle. And these bottle beam traps can be obtained by changing just the distribution of phases in, in the uh, special light modulator. So this shows you the principle of the experiment. Now we need two SLMs. One SLM for the trapping of ground state atoms and one SLM to trap Rydberg atoms. And one has to alternate between these two kinds of traps while the experiment is proceeding. So, uh, and I, I will just show you the time, uh, how the, exp the experiment goes. First of all, you bring the tweezers to trap atoms and you get your assembly of atoms. Then suddenly you switch off the tweezers and very fast before the atom have time to move, you excite the atom into Rydberg state with a laser. And then you switch on the bottle beam. So you have atoms in the ground state, but in the bottle beam. So they will escape. So you have to do something very fast. You prepare them into Rydberg state with micro with microwave and radio frequency excitation. And uh, then you let the atom in the bottle beams. You do the physics that you want to do. And after that, you do the opposite. You decircularize the atom. You switch off the bottle beam. And then very fast, you de-excite the Rydberg with laser pulses. And then you switch on the tweezers. And you try to find out how many atoms have remained in, 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 the, in the tweezers. So you uh, I repeat what I just said. You fill the tweezers array, you excite low Rydberg states, you prepare circular atom in the bottle beam. Then you have uh, circular atoms which interact in the lattice, and then you bring them down and you detect them. And you detect them at individual sites because you see or not laser light, uh, probing laser light in different cells. So, and I repeat, if the atom comes back to initially prepared circular state, you see the fluorescence. If it does not come back, you don't see it. And so they, they started by a first demonstration experiment. They put the atom far enough so that they don't interact. But what they do is that as soon as the atom are in the circular state in all these wells, you apply a microwave rabiosiation on transition between 52 and 50. And you record the rabiosiation. How do you record them? You stop the experiment and you go down to the ground state and you see whether you see an atom or not. And you see that you can see the rabiosiation in all the sites. And the small differences allow you to find out how inhomogeneous the microwave is, how, what are the defects in the experiment. What you can do also is instead of detecting at each site, is to detect by field ionization. But then you take, take, get the, it's no longer selective in position, you get the average of the rabiosiations. And you see that the average of the rabiosiations give you a revival. And the revival describe, uh, allows you to find out how inhomogeneous the different rabiosiations are. So they made all these studies. And finally, last thing I want to say is that they were able in a very precise way to control the interaction between two atoms. You see here this. Uh, what is important is to have the distance between the atom fixed and the angle, whether you are here or here, fixed with precision. And once you do that, you see now the kind of uh, experiment you can do. This is the energy spectrum when the two atoms are in 52, the two atoms are in 51. And in between, you have this level 52, 51, which is split by the interaction. And you can measure this interaction by applying a microwave, which tests the transition between 52, 52, and, and the transition to the symmetric superposition of the two. And you can compare this line with the two photon line, two pho microwave photon line, which bring you the two spin for 52 to 51. So they did this experiment, and you see that you indeed have a doublet. And the separation of the doublet gives you uh, the interaction between the two. And you see the, the atoms are 13 micrometers from each other. The big line corresponds to the transition uh, from plus plus to 
the symmetric superposition, and the small line is a reference, which is a two photon line. And it will appear more clearly on the next slide. You see he, this, he, these are the two lines uh, that you obtain at large distance. Uh, and when you decrease the distance, you see that the effect becomes larger and larger. And if you plot uh, this effect as a function of the distance on a logarithmic scale, you find the one over dq law. So you check this law. You can also check the angular law, which is very interesting. You see that here it corresponds to the interaction of the two spins are like that. And here the interaction of the two spins are like that. So you go from this interaction here to that interaction here. And you have here a magic angle for which the interaction is canceled. So in fact, you can find the angle for which you have no interaction between the spins. So, so they have an excellent control. And the last experiment I show you here is an experiment in which they have been able to prepare one atom in 52 and the other in 51 at a given time. And they use the Rydberg blockade effect for that. So these are the two atoms between which you want to, uh, that you want to prepare in one state or the other. And this is an auxiliary atom C, which blocks, which can block the evolution of atom A. So just you, you start here by a situation in which A and C are not coupled. You are in the magic angle, which doesn't couple them. So the three atoms are excited in the same state. And then you change the configuration and you manage to block that C blocks atom A, but it doesn't have any effect on atom B. So if now you apply a transition which brings the atom from 52 to 51, only atom B will go into the 51. And then at this point, what you do is that you change again and you decouple C from A and you let A and B exchange their spin and you see now this radiociation between the two states. So it's just to show you that it, it's possible to control this at the two, uh, at the two atom level. Now they're in the stage where they try to look at collective effects. So why it is interesting to do with circular state because you have one second and in one second you have millions of radiociations. So if you want to look at phenomena which uh, phase transition of phenomena which recall adiabatic passage, you need really to have this long term. What is next? What they need to do is first of all to go to a cryogenic environment to suppress black body radiation and improve the vacuum. They can even suppress the residual uh, spontaneous emission of circular state. If you put them between plates, the plates can cut off the transition. In fact, uh, Dan Kleppner in 1983 has demonstrated it's possible to increase uh, by a large amount the lifetime of circular atoms. And we hope to get minutes instead of seconds. And finally, this would lead us to maybe to achieve this kind of experiment at a longer time scale. Uh, so it's time to conclude, but I want to, I, I hope I showed you that the circular atoms have gone a long way since they appeared in physics in 1913. At first, they were ideal concepts, but they have become experimental objects, which have been very uh, useful, and they can be manipulated and observed individually, and their coupling to photons or between each other can be controlled with precision. Uh, so, uh, it, it will become, I think, a very interesting tool for doing many body uh, physics, uh, emulating what happened in condensed matter physics in particular. Uh, what I want, I want to make a last comment. This research is often presented as a step toward building a full-fledged quantum computer. We are very far from that because the, the level at which we, the fidelity of all these gates is not 100%. And even if it's very, even if it were close to 100%, you will need to be able to correct uh, for decoherence, which is very far from being achieved today. So whether this research should be described as something which will lead us to a quantum computer is very debatable. We could maybe discuss about that. What is sure is that this physics is I hope I convince you that this physics is fascinating and provides many surprises in the future. And I will stop at this point uh, after having acknowledged, in fact, the Collège de France group. These, uh, in red, you see that, so these are the people who are now uh, leading 
the experiment. And in red, you see all the graduate students who have contributed to the last part of the talk I discussed. You have here some references to papers that I've written recently. But I want also to stress the fact that many groups in the world are doing that. The group of Peter Zoller, the group of uh, Harvard at MIT, where the original ID came from, the group of Hesley Optic uh, uh, for the optical tweezers and for the experiments with uh, arrays of tweezers, and other groups are also participating to that. And I want to add that it has given uh, rise to uh, uh, the creation of many startup companies. This is a company that has been created at Harvard, and this is a company that Antoine Bowe is created in Paris. The Pascal company can sell you a, a, a tweezer array of atoms. So if you want to bypass many years that it will need for you to start from zero, and if you have something like one million euros or one million dollars, <laughs> you would be able to 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 be faster into the game. But of course, this does not, they don't provide circular in the state. So maybe in the next generation, uh, you will have also areas of circular states. So I stop here and uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your very enthusiastic talk. <laughs> One sees clearly that you love what you're talking about. So the, the, the talk is now open for discussions. Are there questions? Thanks a lot for the very clear talk. Uh, I enjoy it a lot. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about the angular momentum conservation argument because you said that since the photon has only one unit of angular momentum, we can only go from, for example, S to P, right? But lately, I've read papers where, because of the counter-rotating terms, you can actually excite more than one atoms with the same photon. And then I'm wondering if the angular momentum really plays that role, or is this something else? No, if you if you consider the interaction of one atom with the laser field, then you have to, then the conservation of angular momentum is important. You need to. Uh, you really need to conserve the, the, the angular momentum between the two. If you have a, a field which is linearly polarized, it has two counter uh, circular photons going on, but uh, you, will, uh, you will excite only with one component and not with the counter rotating right. component. But one photon exciting three atoms will be okay? In the conservation, no, the photon the interaction is one foot. It's a photon, the atom photon interaction is one by one. It's not, a, right. yeah. okay. Thank you. And do I see? And yeah, you were, of course, interested in, in getting a simulator or an annealer yeah. for the an anti ferromagnet, yes. But if you keep a random distribution, you would be doing so for the sort of a spin glass, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think you are right. If if you play, you can play also with the, uh, we you can play also with with some impurities in the system. You could look at phenomena of Anderson localization and a lot of things. If you any kind of noise you will introduce in the distribution might be interesting to simulate effects which occur in real materials. So it's uh, there is a lot of things to to do in in this in this field. I have a question myself. In condensed matter physics, we have also these excitons that we love very much, especially yeah. people working yeah. with yeah. The semiconductors. And there is a special case of a copper oxide where you can have also Grydberg excitons yes. with the excited states yeah. going to 40 or something like that. Do you have? Do you think they have any chance also to enter in this? Uh, I don't know. I don't know enough about this physics, but. Uh, what I have witnessed in the in the past years that uh, this kind of physics is bringing together communities belonging to different areas, uh, not only uh, so it's clear the, the connection between atomic physicists and uh, condensed matter physicists is clear, and also the fact that uh, different candidates for doing this uh, uh, quantum information science are competing with each other is also a way to. Uh, get these people together. Some people believe that by doing this kind of uh, 
simulation, one might get some uh, insight into, uh, for example, synthesizing materials which will be superconducting at higher temperatures, and uh, so you you can you can think of many many things. But uh, I don't know enough about condensed matter physics to answer. Yeah. I was wondering in if these systems of uh, arrays of trapped with yeah. atoms, yeah. would it be possible to couple all of them to the same bosonic mode, like a single cavity mode or a collective no. No, yeah, uh, that's, yes. motion mode? Yeah, that, that's an interesting uh, point. Uh, you know, in, in fact, cavity QED was uh, the experiment that we did in, in cavity were done between uh, until 1910 or 19, uh, 2010 or 2011, when we got all these results, at that point, circuit QED took over. The, the fact that you can replace Rydberg atoms by artificial atoms, which are made of superconducting uh, Johnson junctions, was supposed to be much better. And also, they couple also these artificial atoms to cavities, and they have bosonic uh, uh, error correction codes, which are related to this coupling. And for many years, uh, the feeling was that they had uh, uh, much better, of course, because these circular, these uh, superconducting qubits are held in well defined position. Our Rydberg atoms are just flying qubits, which was not very practical. But now these flying qubits have become also stable qubits. And uh, the next step might be to put them again in a cavity and to look at what happens. Mm. And so this might happen. But for that, we first have to cool everything down for the time this setup is not at the cryogenic temperature, but this is something which might happen in the future. And I have heard that superconduct people working in the superconducting domain are starting to fear that the cold atoms will, will come back in front. Would, would they also couple like ions to the emotional yes. the degree of freedom? Uh, in, yeah, in ion traps, you can you, you do and that. In these Wittberg uh, uh, arrays, because they are also uh, trapped, right? Yeah, but the traps, uh, yes, they are in traps, and you, you could also think of uh, the motion in, 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 the, in the trap, but uh, what they try to do is to avoid this motion and to have the atoms, because any motion in the trap will make fuzzies. In, you know, the interaction between two Rydberg atoms is so sensitive to distance that if the atoms move inside the trap, it will blur the effect very quickly. And again, it's a, it's a reason for what I see which explains why I think that we are very far from the quantum computer, because you have to control everything with such a precision that it becomes uh, unrealistic, I think. If I don't see any more urgent questions, then I think Professor Harosh must be exhausted also by okay. the time. So we thank, thank you. him again. And thank you very much.